Can I ask if the live stream is working, please? And can I have verbal confirmation? Welcome to the meeting of the Planning and Regulatory Committee. The agenda papers and other relevant information for the meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. Please remember your words and actions should be chosen carefully and members are reminded that speeches are limited to three minutes. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and also making a recording. The recording will be available via the Council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Other attendees are permitted to photograph and record the meeting, provided it does not interrupt the business of the meeting. If you wish to be filmed or photographed, please identify yourselves so that anyone who intends to record the meeting can be made aware. Do not wish to. Oh, do not wish to. To ensure that the recording is, the quality is maintained, could members speak as clearly as possible and keep the background noise to a minimum and, show, uh, and ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. Welcome to all those attend, uh, in attendance. I would now ask Mr. Bishop to introduce Identical, but uh, um, in, in respect of the item for Canon Fro, my, I know uh, both the applicant and the agent quite well. I have cleared this with legal, who have uh, confirmed that it's a non declarable interest, but I mention it nonetheless. I think it's responsible to do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the same. Yes. Right. Right. Following that, we'll move on to the minutes. Confirm the meeting minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of May 2022. No matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. Are the minutes of the meeting on the 6th of May approved? Please. Please can members raise their hands to indicate who they are. For <laughs> against abstention. Uh, abstention. Not here. Andrews was not there. Right. Chairman's announcement uh, item five only one to welcome Ingrid Le Lecker uh, <laughs> uh, Lecker um, to her first meeting of this uh, planning committee. I hope you hope well I won't say enjoy the meeting, but at least uh, it won't be too unpleasant. <laughs> 
Thank you. And thanks very much for, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to help you all. Okay, then we'll move now to the main business of the meeting. Um, can I request, request the speakers present in person for the agenda item six to the meeting? Uh, Miss Cotton, local parish council, Mr. Williams, local resident, and Mr. Hall, the applicant, please take their seats in the public garden, which they have done, I believe. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can they? Yes, yeah. 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 I thought yeah. we were on the front row. <laughs> okay. Good morning, and I will welcome to the and will call you to speak when opposite presentation and of the applications pass. Right, the application before us. Land to the west of Claycrit Hill, uh, Dormington, Herefordshire. Proposed installation of a photovoltaic solar farm with associated infrastructure, including inverters, transformers, battery storage, and substation with client and DNO switching equipment with underground connection to the adjacent Dormington staff station. Officer presentation. Gentlemen. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking all members who attended the site visit yesterday, which I hope you all found informative. The application in front of you today seeks permission for a solar farm consisting of an array of ground-mounted solar panels with associated inverters, battery storage, and a new distribution network operated substation. The export generation from this development will be 43 megawatts, which will generate enough to power the equivalent of 11,108 homes. The proposed development will be operational for 35 years, which after which the site will be fully decommissioned with the land restored to agriculture. Next slide, please. The application, the application site is shown on this slide outlined in red. The site consists of several agricultural fields within the parishes of Mordeford and Lubberdine. The total area of the site amounts to 46 hectares, which amounts to 114 acres of arable land. The site is located west of Clayhill Pit Road and the existing established dormitory substation. The existing agricultural access, which we used yesterday, will be utilised for the construction and opera operation of the site, although improvements are proposed in terms of widening and resurfacing. Playhill Pit Road connects the villages of Dormington and Mordeford. The settlement of Dormington is located to the north, around 800 metres from the site, whilst, um, and to the south of the A438. The small settlement of Price Room is to the southeast uh, in an elevated position at around 600 metres from the site. And the villages of Barter Street um, are located to the northwest. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the aerial image of the site and its immediate surroundings. Members will note that the River Froom flows directly through the site and forms the western boundary at the southern end. The topography of the site itself is flat, with the majority of the site falling within flood zone three. The site is in arable production uh, with, and is classed as grade, grade three agricultural land, which is good, good quality. The land does like rise steeply to the east above Friars Room towards Batbury Hill and Swarland and Quarry viewpoints, which is a popular destination and can be seen on the top map um, at the bottom. Uh, there are no public rights of way within the site, however, there are a number of paths to the east on elevated ground where walkers have glimpses of the site between gaps of intervening vegetation. Members will also note St Michael's Hospice, which those on the site, uh, site visit yesterday um, visited. The hospice is located to the northwest of the site, again on elevated land looking down um, on the site. 
The, the hospice itself is located immediately in front of the listed buildings of the former convent and the Roman Catholic Church of St. James. Next slide, please. The application was accompanied by a heritage statement, and this next slide mm -hmm. shows us the gallery of um, um, for, for the statements. The area extended to the eastern fringes of the city of Hereford and south as far as Home Lacey. The yellow patches on this plan show the conservation areas, um, but the closest of which is Mordeford, which is around 900 metres to the south. Dark red areas on this plan show the scheduled monuments, and the green areas show the registered park and gardens. Next slide. <laughs> So this next slide shows all the non-designated assets shaded in green. These largely consist of the unregistered parks and gardens. This plan shows that the southern part of the application site does fall within the unregistered park and garden of Old Sufferton. Unregistered parks and gardens are not on the national register, but are identified locally as having a degree of significance because of their heritage interest. Next slide, please. So moving on to the proposal, uh, this next slide shows the proposed layout of the developments. The proposed development, as previously mentioned, covers a large area of 114 acres and consists of rows of panels across the site, arranged and divided up into separate areas which take account of the existing environmental constraints, such as the river, the power cables, and existing vegetation and trees. You will note that the access from Clay Hill Pit Road and, uh, and the location of the proposed substation to the north of the access track adjacent to the farm buildings where we parked yesterday. The proposed solar farm and battery storage will be connected to the, na the national grid via the existing Dormington substation. The layout plan here identifies where the underground connection between the two substations will be. The seven inverters are shown in purple and are located around the site, whilst the battery storage containers are located along the eastern boundary um, of the site in front of the farm buildings where we parked yesterday. And you might just be able to, to work them out on this plan, shaded in green. The proposed layout identifies a 20 metre buffer either side of the existing power lines, whilst the whole development uh, is to be enclosed with a, a security fence which is positioned 12 metres back, back from all field boundaries and highways. Next slide, please. So this next slide shows a section of the solar panels. All panels are to face south and are to be tilted at a 12 degrees uh, angle. The panels are all mounted one metre above, above the ground at the lowest point and rise to 2.5 metres at their highest point. Each row is to have six panels stacked, giving a width of 6.9 metres, with the length of each row varying across each, each area of the site. There is to be a gap of 2.5 metres between each row. The ground underneath the panels is to be planted with native wildflowers. Members will note that no agricultural grazing is to occur during the lifetime of the developments, which will allow the ground to recover and reduce phosphate runoff entering the local river system. Next slide, please. So this next slide shows the inverters, which there are seven proposed around the site. The inverters are to be located in shipping style containers measuring 12.2 by 2.5 metres. Due to the flood risk across the site, each unit is to be raised one metre above the ground, which incorporates the plus 300 millimetres freeboard allowance above the one in 100 year event flood deaths. This gives an overall height of 3.9 metres above the ground. In terms of flood risk, the application was supported by a flood risk assessment. Consultations have been carried out with the Environmental Agency and the River Lead Range Board. For clarification, the development is considered to be essential infrastructure and is not considered to be inappropriate within Flood Zone 3. Officers have, in line with National Planning Policy Framework, applied the exception test on flood risk. The development is considered to pass the exception tests as the development is considered to provide a wider sustainability benefit to the community in the form of renewable energy that outweighs the flood risk. Both the Environment Agency and the Council's range engineers support the application. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the elevations of the battery storage containers and to which there will be four on site. The containers again are to be raised one metre above the ground in shipping style containers 
measuring 6.1 by 2.4 metres with an overall height of 3.9 metres. Each of these battery storage, storage containers um, will have the capacity of 2 megawatts, giving a combined total, total of 8 megawatts storage on site. Uh, as mentioned already, these are to be located uh, on the eastern, eastern boundary uh, in front of the, the existing agricultural buildings. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, the site will be surrounded with security fencing, which will stand 2.2 metres high and constructed from mesh wire attached to six foot uh, wooden posts. Uh, within the fence, mammal gates are to be installed within, um, within the fences, um, as shown on the top drawing here. And the fence will also support CCTV security cameras, which will be located around the site. Next slide, please. Uh, the development will utilise the existing access from Clayhill Pit Road. However, improvements will be made in terms of widening of the first 30 metres for the track to ensure that two HGVs can pass each other. The first 20 metres of the main track is to have a bounded surface to help prevent transference of gravel and debris onto the public highway. It should be noted that the development will take six months to construct and will generate um, an um, anticipated 8,777 two-way movements during this time. The application has been supported for the transport statement, which outlines the mitigation during the construction period. Uh, all traffic is to approach the site from the A438. The Council's Highways Engineer has offered um, support for the application. Next slide, please. This next slide shows a proposed um, site for the distribution network operated substation uh, along with the, um, the layout plans, which is to be located north of the existing access track. The substation will contain various components which will have a maximum height of 5.9 metres. The substation will be surrounded by security fencing standing at 2.9 metres and will connect to the existing substation via underground cables. Next slide, please. So this next slide uh, is a proposed landscaping mitigation and biodiversity enhancement. The landscaping plan has been amended and added to at various stages of the application to take into account comments, and representations and comments made by the council's own landscape officer. The main component, components of the landscaping scheme is to reinforce and strengthen all hedgerows and field boundaries, allowing hedgerows and vegetation to grow in height. A band of wood, woodland planting is proposed on the western boundary closest to the hospice to help uh, mitigate the, the visual impact of the development on the hospice. Um, not just the proposed, but the existing, um, the existing substation as well. The landscaping proposed is considered to be consistent with the nature and character of the existing planting and character of the landscape. Next slide, please. So moving on to some photos of the site, um, both of these photos are taken from the same location within the site from the bridge crossing over the River Froome looking towards St Michael's Hospice. Um, the photos were taken at different times of year. The first in January of this year when there was very little um, in terms of green vegetation and second I took yesterday during the site visit. It is within this field and on the top western boundary that a strip of woodland planting is proposed to help mitigate the visual impact of the development when viewed from the hospice. Next slide, please. So these next photos are from Swandon Quarry. Uh, the larger of the photos was taken a few weeks ago, and uh, luckily the yellow oil seed rake, uh, which is visible in this photo, is the application site. There is additional planting proposed within these areas, and although the panels will not be screened completely, the planting will help soften and filter views um, from this location. Next slide, please. As part of the application, the visual impact assessment provided several photo montages from several viewpoints within the wider landscape, which has, uh, um, have, have been assessed. This one is following on from the previous slide at Swan and Quarry and shows the development 10 years after the proposed planting. There will still be patches um, of the development um, visible. You will note that the application site does not form part of any designated landscape. However, I would bring it to members' attention that it is in close proximity to the Y Valley AOMP, of which Swan and Quarry is within. <coughs> Next slide, please. 
So this next photo montage is from the public right of way to the west of the site. Again, ten uh, again ten years after the plant. I'm sorry, it's the public right of way to the east. I'm sure, it gets the east of the site. Again, ten years after the planting. Walkers will be able to see glimpses of the proposed proposed panels as they travel along the public right of way. Again, the views are broken up and seen in conjunction with the existing substation and power lines. Uh, there are a number of residential pro uh, residential properties in this area on elevated on elevated positions, uh, which look down at the site. I think this photo montage probably gives you an idea that um, from these residential properties, this, the, the development will be viewed. Next slide, please. So members will recognise these photos from St Michael's Hospice, which we visited yesterday and which is located on elevated ground to the west of the site. Members will have seen the updated sheets and the latest representation from the hospice, um, which was received um, last week. Officers visited the hospice with the applicants and agent to consider the visual impact of the development during the, during the process. As part of the landscape mitigation, a band of woodland planting is proposed around the northwest corner of the site, in addition to the improvements in hedgerows, which, although won't screen the development entirely, will filter and break, um, break the views from the hospice grounds. It is important to note that the panels face away from the hospice and the view will, will be that of the back frame of the, of the panels. Next slide, please. These photos are taken from within site along the main, along the main track where we walked yesterday. The, the top photo looking south towards Larport Lane and the bottom looking north. Members will note the existing power lines and flat topography of the site. All existing tracks are to be maintained within screen and there is no need for any additional hard sanding. Next slide, please. In terms of planning policy, both local and national policy clearly support proposals which generate renewable energy and recognise the role that planning must pay in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and meeting renewable energy targets. Crucially, the national planning policy framework advises that applications for renewable energy should be approved if impacts are or can be made acceptable, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Applications of this nature and scale will inevitably impact upon the local environments. The application in front of you today has been supported by a range of technical reports and surveys and detailed drawings, and was developed following extensive public consultation and pre-application engagement. It is clear that the major advantage of this site and the reason why it has, has been chosen for, for, for the development is its close prox proximity to the existing Dormington substation as well as its flat topography. In terms of heritage, although part of the site is within the unregistered historic park and garden, the development is not considered to affect the significance of any of the heritage assets or have an adverse impact on any of the settings. With regards to ecology, the scene includes the vision of native hedgerows, native woodland, and native rich flat and planting. Overall, the proposal offers a 109% increase in biodiversity net gain. Council's colleges has not identified any significant harm, and conditions are recommended to secure further details for biodiversity measures and enhancements. Full consideration has been given to all neighbouring residential properties. It is recognised that a number of the residential properties on elevated ground to the east will be able to view the developments, as well as the properties along Larkport Lane to the south. The applicants have submitted a noise assessment, which concludes that the development will not have an adverse impact on any nearby properties. In addition, the application was supported with a detailed and comprehensive Linton Blair study um, of the development, which assessed the potential effects of glint and glare from the development on the surrounding area. The conclusion of this assessment was no significant impacts on surrounding road users or the residential um, dwellings within the local area. The hardest consideration with this application has been that in terms of the impacts on landscape character and visual immunity. All of the representations received have raised concerns on these grounds. A proposal of this scale and nature will inevitably have an impact on the surrounding landscape. There would be harm, or there will be harm, to the appearance and visual community of the area when viewed from sections of the public rights of way and when viewed from residential properties. It is acknowledged that all the proposed planting and reinforcement of petrols will take time to develop and mature. There are conditions relating to further details on the landscape strategy, and officers will be seeking to secure that mature plants 
are used in the planting and that the species are reflective of the current and historic landscape character. To conclude, um, as the report and the application submission demonstrates, there are environmental benefits in terms of renewable energy and a net gain in habitat biodiversity. The greatest significant benefits of this scheme is considered to be the, imper the imper imperative to tackle climate change as recognised in legislation and energy policies, which clearly and decidedly outweigh the, the temporary and less than substantial harm to the visual landscape community in the locality and the nearby designated heritage assets. Drawing all the issues together and taking all material considerations into account, as outlined within my report, it is considered that the proposal would make the material contribution the objectives of tackling climate change and achieving decarbonisation of energy production. On balance, it is considered that any adverse impacts would, would not significantly and demonstrably outweigh this benefit. The proposal is therefore considered an acceptable form of development that accords with the objectives of relevant national and local policies as a whole. The application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions set out in my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jim, and can I congratulate you on a very thorough and exhaustive report and presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I invite Ms. Cotton, representing Dormington and Waterford Group Parish Council, to speak. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's important to say that we regret the loss of visual immunity, but recognise that there's a balance here. Um, the switch from fossil fuels to renewables uh, is a global need and not just a county or UK-wide policy. Uh, there were objections made on carbon accounting, but that's actually outside the remit of the parish council. Um, the proposed land is floodplain. When we made the site visit, we could see that there'd been an impact on, on uh, the planting there due to recent flooding, and the planting had failed as a result of that flooding. It's not high-grade agricultural land, and as Rebecca's already said, it's not within the SSSI or AONB, and there are no public footpaths. And we were pleased that uh, in terms of the loss of a visual immunity, the solar panels can be removed at the end of the 25 or 35 year lease period and the land reverted to its previous use. It's not a permanent structure, in other words. Um, the visual impact on individuals wasn't a material consideration for objections to planning, although we've already talked about visual immunity. Um, the parish council felt that the new and existing pylons and substation already at Clay Hill Pitch impinge far more on the views of a much larger population area and the permanent structures, and we didn't get a chance to comment on that particularly. Um, Comrade Energy, we were pleased to say, listen to previous public and parish concerns about its original plans, initially for a diesel backup generator, which we weren't happy about at all, which eventually became plans for a solar farm with associated battery storage. It listened to our comments about planting native species and extended <coughs> the consultation at our request. As a result of this, we were pleased to note that the area to be covered has been reduced and more planting has been agreed. A representative Comrade Energy attended several parish council meetings. These are public meetings, well publicised and held online during COVID and which continued online until last month. However, nobody attended in person to discuss concerns and only one person attended online and wrote to express their concerns, but their objection wasn't based on a material consideration apart from the loss of visual immunity. At that point, the planning proposal had not been submitted to the portal and so we could not legitimately discuss it at the meeting, at our parish council meetings. At the parish council meeting where the planning proposal was discussed and our decision was to be made, we asked the council and one member of the public present if there are any grounds for objection. And we read out the list of material considerations. There were no objections, and so we supported the proposal. Essentially, there were no material considerations on which the Paris Council could object to the solar farm, and in principle, of course, it supported the switch to renewables. Thank you very much. Oh, there is one more thing I'd like to say, and that is about community benefit. And we are very hopeful that we will, in some way, shape or form, receive some community benefits from this, because we recognise that other solar farms are, uh, are, are contributing community benefits to their local communities. So we hope that there is some more work to be done. All right, I've got it. Thank I've got it. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. And now I invite Mr. Williams, a uh, local resident, to speak. You have three minutes. Thank you. 
But whilst I welcome the move from fossil fuels to more sustainable energy, I'm here to share concerns raised formally and informally by a number of neighbours in the cryers from Sufton Lane area. The proposed solar installation will convert a large part of the rural landscape to Broome Valley from agriculture use into metallic and glass structure of industrial proportions. I share the concerns of my toss from the other side of the valley about the adverse visual impact. What was once green becomes a sea of grey. I would suggest this installation is not in keeping with the aim of the core strategy, which says there should be no significant detrimental effect on the character of the rural landscape. The orientation of the panels and the site towards the south face the rear of my property and the others in Sutton Lane. Again, I refer to the core strategy that the installation should be approved, provided it does not adversely affect residential amenity. I'm not convinced about the uh, anti glare um, studies that have been taken for the road actually help us in the, in the dwellings. I'm unaware of any real benefits to the local community. There'll be minimal local employment to manufacture or installation of panels. I'm told that the panels were manufactured in the Far East and installed by teams from Spain. No cheaper electricity for those having to sacrifice our valley for the greater good. No subsidised solar panels. No lower bills for the 11,108 homes that it will power. And the proposed EV charge on points have been dropped. I know from the Dormington and Parish Council uh, their, their views. Furthermore, the claims of increasing biodiversity are, in my view, <coughs> questionable. I'm not sure that removing various uh, crops and placing with single grassland would, uh, be, would be colonised only by organis organisms that favour one crop environments. Would the number of pollinating insects still be attracted? I understand that there will be mitigating measures taken to hide the view from sight. But this begs the question, why hide this installation if it does not have a detrimental effect on rural landscape? It appears a new tree cover and hedges may screen the site in about 15 years' time. To misquote William Hague, many of us won't be around in 15 years' time. The mitigation measures are neither specific enough nor robust enough to do the job they propose, especially in the winter months when the trees are without leaves. Was it not feasible to put this site in the industrial area of Rodolus with its acres of brown fields and abandoned munition facilities? <coughs> However, if the proposal is approved, I believe the solar installation to be smaller, better concealed, and of benefit to the immediate community, not the power company, but the landowner. Thank you. Thank you. I have a copy of <coughs> Right. Now I invite Mr. Hall, the applicant agent to speak. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good, yeah, good morning. My name is George Hall. I'm the uh, development manager to this project. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, but also the engagement that we've had throughout this uh, the last year. From local residents, uh, from the hospice, from the parish council, from the site visit yesterday. Um, it has been uh, very uh, enjoyable in many ways to develop this, this project through. Um, a quick little bit about, about Comrade, we're uh, an independent power provider and our aim is to build, own, operate and keep this project. We supply gas and electricity to uh, commercial and industrial users and this, this um, so the solar farm will be an important part of supplying electricity both to the, to the network but also to our customers. Um, just to pick up on a point that uh, Rebecca said about the background to this project, uh, it has a couple of guises, it was originally a diesel uh, stall project, it then uh, became a gas peaking plant project, but after um, working with the local community, it was kind of decided that uh, a solar project would be the best way forward. We went into a pre-application process with a much wider, larger scheme, but after discussing with uh, uh, concerned people on both sides of the valley, we reduced this down in terms of its scale and its size. Um, and we've done a, a large piece of um, very valuable engagement work, whether that's uh, talking to uh, Paul on his uh, on, on, on his patio and presenting both uh, on webinars and in person to um, to the parish council, but also holding drop-in events uh, on the village green. Um, and throughout that that process, we've listened to the local local people. 
Uh, we've had cups of teas and uh, on various patios and uh, the gardens and uh, taking people's views in, which has definitely helped and uh, uh, shaped our screening. Um, and in the past sort of three or four months, we've also worked very closely with the hospice to try and develop uh, a scheme that they are happy with. Um, but I think this is the key, the key headlines from our point of view is it will provide enough renewable energy to power 11,108 homes. It will, it will say nearly 10,000 uh, kilograms of carbon in the first year. And it helps the UK and Herefordshire Council towards its targets of net zero, cheaper electricity, security of supply, uh, by also providing a significant biodiversity net gain. Therefore, I ask you to support this application. Many thanks, Peter. Thank you, thank you Mr. Hall. And now, can I ask that the, uh, the uh, speakers return to the public gallery? Thank you. C can I just uh, we'll move on to the ward members in this particular case? Because, um, um, the parish uh, council Dorrington and Waterford is represented, represented by two heritage councils, councillors. I, I don't know how the boundary commission split a particular parish, and I'm not quite sure, but anyway, it, into two council wards. But anyway, I'll uh, first invite um, Councillor John Hardwick and then Councillor Andrews afterwards. Councillor, well, thank you, Chairman. Um, just, just to make it clear, the uh, Actual application is in two wards, uh, Backbury, which is mine, which is Dalton and Waterford, uh, Trackley, and uh, Hagley Ward, which is uh, Black Street Overtime area. Um, but I would agree with you that the actual boundary between the two wards is somewhat irregular, uh, to say the least. Um, but firstly, I would like to thank um, Rebecca Gentleman, the planning officer, for a very very thorough report and presentation this morning, and also the applicants for um, the pre-application um, contact that uh, was made and um, the engagement with the local community uh, to try and make this uh, application acceptable to all. Obviously, the main issue that we are uh, concerned with this morning is, is landscape farm. And um, it has to be said that um, the applicant has gone to a great deal of trouble to um, actually improve the uh, tree planting over the area to try and mediate. There is a fine balance for and against uh, this application, and hence why this has been called to committee. Um, obviously, there are great benefits um, with regards to uh, power. Um, especially with um, the U Ukraine situation, etc., that we uh, face at the moment, increased uh, fuel bills. Um, but obviously, um, uh, the landscape uh, is exceptionally important within the area. Um, urban wilderness have submitted further suggestions for increased tree and woodland planting. Um, that's uh, something for the committee to um, actually consider in their debate as to whether sufficient landscaping has been proposed um, in this application that we do this morning. Although the development is considered temporary, uh, we're obviously looking at a period of 35, 40 years, two generations, certainly last longer than me, and uh, the majority of us in this, this room. Um, so it is an important decision that we make this morning. One of the main advantages that I would like to point out is um, in the biodiversity gain and reduction in phosphates within the Froome Valley. We're all well aware that the phosphate level in the Froome Valley is exceptionally high and um, actually grassing down arable land, um, planting wildflower meadows and not grazing will uh, obviously be a great advantage. 
So I'll leave it at that, Chairman, and look forward to the debate. Councillor Andrews. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to my colleague, Councillor <laughs> John Hardwick, for what he's just said, which I echo a lot. Again, I'd like to thank you, Frank Rebecca Gentleman, on a on a report very thorough. Um, obviously, most of the most of it is in Councillor Hardwick's area. Um, what the concerns of St Michael's Hospital is is obviously visual impact, as we've all got to remember that St Michael's Hospital is where unfortunately people go, and it's the last thing they might see is the Fring Valley. So the echo point um, is in the report and the updates that are coming from St Michael's Hospice on planting, on the planting scheme. So I do do wish that the committee has a look at that and implements the conditions of that. Regarding anything else, the Barter Street and Loverdine Parish Council do not object to this scheme, um, which is good. Um, obviously. The land that's going to be <coughs> on is grade three agricultural land. We recognise that it does flood. And obviously, going back to echoing the comments from Council Hardwick about biodiversity and everything else and getting the goodness back into the land and foster its levels, we all got to look at that. One thing I'd like to say we all, I understand, we need to look at green energy. We would like to see national policy change that every new home has solar panels. So if schemes like this don't need to come up, come along to us. But on the flip side of that, we need to reduce carbon, fossil fuels in our country and in the world. That's all I've got to say at the moment. Thank you. Right, now we'll move to the debate. Um, can I thank all those members all the members who attended the site meeting yesterday, which I think was well worth a, a visit to. <coughs> Councillor, everyone, Councillor Loxton, then Councillor Mill, then Councillor Mill, and then Councillor Burns. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. There are many strong redeeming features in this application. We need power, we need green renewable energy, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. While no power source is perfect, solar power is known as the safest source of energy. Um, solar energy is weather dependent and the efficiency drops on cloudy and rainy days, so the more sunshine, the better. A key feature is the close proximity of the farm, the Dormington substation. Um, I'm also pleased to note that both Dormington and Mordeford Parish Councils and Bartistry and Lugwardine Parish Council support this application. Visual impact of a solar farm is a key consideration. The visual impact has been amended during the application process. Trees will be planted to fill in the gaps to screen off the solar farm. However, um, it's right in front of the magnificent view of the Sword and Quarry viewpoint. It will be an eyesore, ruining this magnificent view of the Wye and Lug Valleys to, to Hereford and beyond. But I believe the benefits of solar energy outweigh the visual impact on the landscape. Can I also mention? Briefly, our feathered friends, 56 bird species have been recorded on the site. There are three skylark territories. Many common bird species have been seen using solar farms. So and I'm also pleased to know that at least 15 bird nesting boxes are going to be strategically placed <coughs> within the site boundary. I will probably vote in favour, but I'm keen to hear the debate. Thank you. Councillor Mill. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to start out by following up uh, the answer query I had from uh, yesterday's site meeting uh, about birds, and I'm thank thankful to Councillor Foxton for introducing that. Um, uh, section five of the applicant's ornithology report uh, does acknowledge that there is an issue with um, uh, an impact on birds or um, bird impact strikes on, on these large solar farms. And I uh, dug down a bit. Uh, 
and discovered really that the although as i said this is an issue uh particularly i think with um clandestine birds who get confused with the flight paths and possibly with wading bark birds who maybe mistake panels for water for water bodies or whatever swifts and solos i think as well and i think bats too particularly the juveniles who whose acoustic um, abilities have not been particularly tuned there's quite a lot of cases of those crashing into the bed but there isn't a great deal of uh, scientific literature on them on them um i mean perhaps I'm, i should I, I should have i should have let the case officer say say this but uh i i just wonder whether if the case officer could uh, uh could um uh i don't know tweak uh, condition six perhaps a, a bit to um give some ongoing monitoring of the wild birds the impact of the wild birds should the application be approved Comment now. Can I come back to that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, is that it? Or... Uh, that, uh, that's it for the moment. I may come back if I. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, apologies that I wasn't able to make the site visit yesterday. Um, I'm, I have just a couple of questions actually um, for the case officer. Is that what was the reason not to graze um, in order to manage a species rich grassland? Um, I note, and I think it's great that you know there's a um, management plan and the and I've read the um, the conditions for the hedgerow and vegetation management and wildlife. But um, I actually read the Agricultural Good Practice Guidance for Solar Farms, which was authored by the National Farmers Union. And they've really cited some really good examples. So for, my first question is, what was the reason not to graze using, um, um, you know, uh, some of those examples with um, either uh, sheep, I understand about phosphates, but using rotation. And also, I'm glad that it was picked up by the parish council because I'm not actually quite sure what the... Uh, what will the community benefits be? I know that there's going to be some education, but um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to be looking at uh, the social aspects um, and the, you know, the social benefits to the local community. It's noted in condition 13, but no specifics. So, you know, um, going back to uh, a dual land use of the um, of the site is like beekeeping on site, or is there involvement of Herefordshire Meadows Group or Herefordshire Wildlife Trust to actually help manage the grasslands? Um, it, it's really for me is that how do you work with the community and offer those additional benefits which can uh, for 35 years i agree and i'm glad that uh, councillor Nolan has talked about surveying because how can we demonstrate um benefits not only to uh, the local landscape but also to the community yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to come back on that one now. So in terms of the social, the social benefits, when the application was originally submitted, you would have seen that there was um, electrical vehicle charging points uh, included within the application, which came out of the um, pre-application and the community consultation. That was something that the locals were quite keen on. The reason they were taken out was because we had concerns within the floodplain and also in terms of the long-term management, who was going to be responsible for them. Um, now, um, since they've been removed, the applicant uh, is uh, in talks with Norderford and Donington Parish Council, and they, there will be electrical vehicle charging points within both of those settlements. It falls outside of this planning process, um, but they are in talks with both um, to, to provide with both of those um, two settlements. Um, you picked up on the other, uh, on the other social benefits, um, which again was developed throughout the application process, which was the training and educational. Um, they are the applicants are keen to work with. They're already working with Waterford School, but also the local colleges and the university in terms of those training and educational um, uh, educational facilities, allowing schools and colleges to visit the sites, but also to carry out workshops um, to enhance um, knowledge of not just solar panels, but the company do other renewable um, projects as well. Um, now, Barter Street and Dorrington. Uh, so sorry, Barter Street Parish Council did request the um, Section 106 contributions in terms of um, community benefits. Unfortunately, our policies in terms of renewable energy don't require any contributions to be made. I have covered it off within um, 
within the section of my reports, um, but there's no, there's no requirement um, for any financial contributions to be made. Um, moving on to the, you made another point about the grazing. Mm -hmm. um, now, when, the, when we were going through the pre application, um, certainly it was something that, which was being looked at um, in terms of the grazing, and it is um, elsewhere in the country on most soda farms are grazed um, to keep them in agricultural production. The difficulty with this site is the river Froome. Um, it's unusual that it's got the river Froome flowing directly through it. Um, and the, it was our own ecologist which picked it up during, um, during the habitat regulations and the pre application that actually um, there was an opportunity here to take all grazing out um, to help reduce in that reduction of phosphates. Um, and that's purely the reason why it has been taken out. Um, looking at the requirements of the habitat regulations, um, the, the site will just be wildflowers and, and will be mowed um, twice yearly. Does that answer? It? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's fine. Councillor Bowen, are there any other speakers? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a few questions and a <coughs> proposal as well. Uh, the, I wonder what trees are being proposed to be planted in the, the hedgerow. I might have suggest black, perhaps black poplars, which are an old established Herefordshire breed and are in decline apparently. And that, that might be an opportunity to uh, increase the opportunity for having black poplars in this country. Just a thought. Um, I think if you, surely that might be a good thing. They also grow quite tall, so they would be more useful in mitigating the damage to the landscape, from, particularly from the hospice. Um, and I think we should have the average power generated and rather than just the maximum, because obviously half the year, the amount of sunshine is fairly limited. And I wonder what is the battery capacity? Is it enough? And sufficient to power 11,000 houses in times of darkness, which we've been told that these, these, this wonderful proposal will do. Um, question. Um, and will the locals get reduced cost electricity? They have to put up with some of the handicaps of this scheme, which um, will certainly upset some people, I think. Their, their grief might be mitigated by their cheaper electricity. Is that a possibility? Thank you. I think I think can confirm the difficulty in there is what is local. Um, we'd all be local to that particular site if that was the case. <laughs> but you do have these these circles we yeah, put yeah. around the scheme, which I thought yeah. might give some idea of what was local and what wasn't. Um, yeah, to come back on the, I think the first point was um, surrounding the landscaping in terms of tree plantage and the possibility of the black um, poplars. So in terms of um, in terms of the landscaping, you would have noted that there are conditions for a further landscaping strategy to be developed to come in. And the reason for that condition is although we have the landscape mitigation plans, we know where the landscaping is going to be. Um, we want that strategy to be developed in terms of species, in terms of densities. Um, we will be ensuring as part of that strategy um, that plants go in at a reasonable size. You're not having young plants, you're having mature plants go in. Uh, and the species will be um, certainly native to um, the area. Um, and I, I'll certainly take, um, if it is a recommended for approval, I will certainly take that on board with our, um, I'll have to discuss it with the landscape office and the ecologist. Obviously, the, the site has its constraints in terms of being within a floodplain. And so we will we'll need to ensure that any species um, are, com are com compatible. And we will certainly take that forward. Um, I think the next point was surrounding the battery storage. Um, this was asked on site yesterday. Now, in terms of the battery storage, there's, there's four batteries on site. They um, each have a capacity of two megawatts. So there's a combined uh, storage capacity of eight megawatts. And the, the reason for these battery storage, so if we do have um, uh, certainly a, a blackout or um, certainly we do have uh, a, a period where, where the sun isn't shining, we've got the, the, the site will have the backup storage, which will be eight megawatts per hour, which will be um, sufficient capacity, um, certainly over that short short period, um, to to prevent um, to prevent power cuts in those homes. Um, there'll always be a risk, um, um, certainly if we do experience um, bad bad weather, but with so farms like this that we can have, we're reducing that impact, we're reducing the possibility of power cuts. Yes, um, 
And what, what is your view on reduced cost electricity for the locals? Yeah, um, sorry, I, I, I did write that down. Um, yeah, and so in terms of that, again, it falls out of the planning process. Um, so it's not something that we can, that we can um, as developers do. Um, I, I think certainly it's, it's, it's the, the applicants uh, or certain parish councils in the conditions to approach the applicant. Again, it falls outside the planning process. There's certainly not a requirement. It's a national local policy um, that we as the planning department um, can, can assist upon. Uh, thank you. Um, if the total power output on a good day is 1100, this is 11,000 houses have been. Um, and is, is it what, how many, how many megawatts was it all together? Um, so, so the size itself will be 43 megawatts, but it's, it's, it's feeding into the national grid. So it's going directly into the national grid um, and it will be 11,100. It, 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 it equates to 11,100. Yes. It, it, it doesn't feed in 11, 43 megawatts all the time by a very long way. So is um, the eight megawatt battery capacity sufficient? Should not be perhaps a bit more so that the houses can be powered for longer by the sunshine collected. Um, I think they would all be, I, I think they would always um potentially be looked favorably if we had more battery storage, but the application in front of you today only has is a housing for the post eight. Um, and as as officers we're really <coughs> happy that, that is is sufficient at this time. Yes, I do believe also there's a much more advanced battery technology coming through at the moment, which could thoroughly improve matters. But uh, thank you for your uh, for your report. And yes, I look forward to black boxes. I think we may have gone on well over three minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just the battery technology is making giant strides as we as we speak this afternoon, and I think that uh, we may see some some new. Applications for certainly more with the more advanced battery technology that is on its way. Can I thank you also for mentioning the Black Poplar, which I'm a great fan of. I've got quite a lot of Black Poplars myself, and they have magnificent views. I, I, I agree, Mr. Chairman. I do hope we can get some of those there. Councillor Andrews. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. And thank you for the site visit, which was really most informative. I was Matter of what has been said already. So, but given the fact that we um, have to find an alternative to fossil fuels, solar panels are solar farms are one of the ways forward. I take great comfort from the fact that both parish councils support this application, which is quite unusual, really. So that is a good sign, and I'm happy to move the recommendation for approval. Right, Councillor Johnson, and then Councillor Payne. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my, my technical knowledge of these particular type of installations is extraordinarily limited, but I wonder if the case officer or the applicant can comment upon the likely traffic movements. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about maintenance of the whole thing. There are the panels themselves, um, the batteries, uh, transformers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, is there any anticipated traffic movements in regards to maintenance of this whole unit. Uh, yeah, no, I, I can confirm that. So um yeah certainly I think I think I picked up on it within my presentation that the majority of the traffic is during the um, construction period. But once it becomes operational the access will remain um, and there will be a requirement for maintenance and just general security. That that's not envisaged to be more than one visit probably per week and it will only be uh, um, a car or the, at the most a maintenance uh, vehicle. That the access into the site, um, it already provides access to the existing dormitory station, um, <laughs> the recent extension they've had there. Um, but we don't see, we haven't had any objection in terms of, um, from the highways officer, it's the access has visibility of 250 meters in both ways. So the access um, will certainly be able to cope um, with the anticipated traffic generation once it is operational. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Can I say, Councillor Andrews moved the, the officer's recommendation. Is there a seconder for that? Mm -hmm. okay. Councillor Bob. Right, then we'll move on to Councillor Fagan. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the report. And I'm sorry that I couldn't make the site visit yesterday. Um, I, I think the issue here um, 
apart from the, the visual immunity, is also this temporary loss of good quality agricultural land at a time when food security is becoming more of an issue versus the energy security at a time when we know we need to decarbonize and transition off fossil fuels. Um, so I am confident that the landscape uh, landscaping scheme will take um, will mitigate the impact of the um, development, but it will take time. And um, I, I do hope that the mem uh, people who are in the hospice um, realize that this is we are looking at future generations of security that we can offer future generations as well um, and um, realize that in time the landscaping will improve the view. Um, I just wanted to add that I welcome the 109% increase in biodiversity um, net gain and the 453% increase in hedgerow units. Um, I recently read an environment agency report between 2016 and 2020 in Herefordshire, we lost 10% of our hedgerow tree cover over um, that period and that permanent grassland was down by 32%. So I think that increase in grassland uh, will greatly increase carbon sequestration and um, have good biodiversity um, impact. Um, I would just request that if, if there's a way of um, ensuring that the applicant continues their engagement with the parish councils to um, sort of uh, on the on the educational program, but also in, in terms of how any impacts that develop might be ameliorated through discussions with the parish councils, if, if there was a way of, um, if not conditioning it, making it a sort of recommendation. Um, I, we can certainly put that in terms of the decision. We won't be able to condition it, but we can certainly put it on as an informative. We can certainly be, um, uh, keep up to date and yeah, try and encourage them as much as possible. Um, I know that they have been in talks um, certainly over the last few weeks with the parish councils when they've been just talking about the new position for the electrical vehicle charging points. Those discussions are already taking place. Um, okay. Uh, um, Mill. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, <clears throat> I didn't feel, um, if I, people forgive me, quite so uh, uh, ready to dismiss the um, impact on historic landscape, as the case also appears to do, as you expect me to say. The, um, whether or not the, the, the various design landscapes of uh, Old Sutton, Sutton Court, um, uh, and that of uh, the Edward, Edward Welby Pugin establishment of the convent uh, that we saw, uh, with its incredibly well designed, if I may say so, uh, new hospice building. So, congratulations to whichever panel committee. Gave consent for that, but it's uh, within its landscape extremely well. Um, afterwards, uh, councillors uh, uh, Ryan Andrews and myself tootled off, off to, uh, the piss officer's recommendation up to the quarry site on Backbury Hill and um, admired the verdant vales and the, and the distant hills. And we, when we talked to ancient camps and wondered why anybody lucky enough to live in Herefordshire would want, to, want to, to go anywhere else. Um, I'm just going to uh, uh, read out, if I may, from an extremely learned article in Garden History published about this landscape uh, by uh, Dr. Goodchild. Um, he, uh, he's talking about the heritage clergyman and orchardist John Beale, who, who knew this place in the 1650s. Um, and Beale, standing where Paul Polly and I stood yesterday, described the Throne Valley with its, with its water meadows and, and traces of which survive today at Foot of Backbury and Old Sutton as. Uh, quote, a landscape of ravishing beauties, which requires little of art to render it the most illustrious and proper for a most accomplished Elysium. <laughs> Nor will I travail ab abroad for, for this fine site that is amongst the several eminences upon which the ancient Britons did extremely affect to plant themselves and so on. The experience of this landscape inspired Beale's friend, the London diarist and Royal Society founder, John Evelyn, to write his Elysium Britannicum, a seminal work which has an important place in the early development of the picturesque and later English landscape style, exemplified by Humphrey Repton, who, with James Wyatt, designed registered George's landscape at nearby Sutton Court. Evelyn selected our site for his Elysium as a richly varied tract of landscape, 
an allegory of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. There, the most dainty paradise on ground, in which all pleasures plenteously abound. And none doth, does others happiness envy, the painted flowers that breathe up shooting high, the dales for shade, the hills for breathing space, the trembling groves, the crystal running by. And in Zinon Sydney, it's Arcadia, which describes Calendar's garden, whose trees were as a pavilion, that they to the trees a mosaical floor, and so it seemed that art therein would be, be delightful. So I leave members to reach their own judgment as to the impact upon uh, the historic landscapes of, of Sutton and Longmore and Bankbury and the viewers as they make their decision on this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mel. I, I shall refrain from, from reciting <laughs> Keats's on the all pervading and all beauty to you, which I can do from memory. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think we, uh, this is the planning committee, not the poetry reading committee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the vice chairman would like to say before anybody else. So, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, follow that. Eh? Okay. The most unpoetic a few lines from me there. I think possibly this is um, one of the most important applications that uh, I've ever had come before me while I sat on the planning committee. Uh, this is a very big decision to make. This area of 46 hectares, a beautiful Herefordshire countryside. And this is the equivalent of 75 football pitches, you know, to put it in layman's terms, simple terms, for somebody like me to understand. This is huge. So for us to commit to cover it in panels of associated equipment for the next 35 years really is a big decision for us to make. There's lots of questions in my mind about its positioning, its need, and how it would affect the area. Now, fortunately, we've had a, a, an excellent, very thorough report from our officer. There's no objections from statutory consultees. And there is uh, support from uh, both the parish councils that are above the site. For me, though, the most important uh, feature is that it's described as temporary. I don't know how temporary 35 years is, but I understand that there is, those who don't like the idea, there's light at the end of the tunnel and you wonder where technology will be in 35 years time. You go back 35 years and we're still impressed with a, a battery that you put in your transistor radio. So where we will be then is, uh, it, it is, um, is a thought. Uh, but I will be going with officer recommendation today and voting in favour. Councillor Watson, did you want to speak? Yes, so I'm just coming back on one of the points, um, and it follows up uh, with what's been said by Councillor Mill is that I know that it can't be a condition, but could I urge the applicant and the parish council to engage the Heritage Meadows Group and Heritage Wildlife Trusts, particularly with their. Um, uh, Herefordshire Wilder project that is um, in place till 2023 and it's a tremendous opportunity um, if they're looking at uh, community projects to engage uh, those two uh, organisations. Thanks. Right. Are there any other speakers? There are none. Perhaps the officer now will do the summary. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to come back. Um, I haven't come back on Councillor Milne's um, original um, question in terms of Condition 6, which um, relates to the ecological working method statement. I just wanted to remind myself and reread it, but I think you, your question was, could you add in a requirement for it to be, to be monitored um, throughout the lifetime of the development? And I'm happy to do that. Um, so I will work on um, some of the, the, the monitoring um, of uh, of the, uh, the ecological works will, will form part of that, that condition. Um, but other than that, I'd just like to thank members um, for, for the debate. I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Thank you. I do. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry. Um, just to say that uh, I think the, the application today identifies the benefits of pre application discussion at a very early stage. And I think that this is what has actually happened with this proposal. It's, it's evolved from a, um, a, a proposal to cover a larger area, a reduced area, engagement with the local community, engagement with officers, et cetera, has brought about a scheme which uh, 
has been well has been well considered. Been well considered by the committee today in terms of the heritage issues, the landscape issues, uh, highways, etc. To cover, I'm, I'm content we've covered all those issues moving forward uh, and ecology as well um, and, and climate change. And you've covered all those aspects in in, in moving towards the recommendation if you have in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Can I just say that uh, congratulate the parish councils, the applicants, applicants on what appears from outside to be an exemplar for the consultation processes that take place prior to this particular application. We'll now move to the ward members for summing up. Thank you, Chairman. I think Mr. Bishop's done it very eloquently for me, um, or for all this, I should say. Um, but I would like to uh, thank the planning officer and, and uh, the applicant parish councils for the uh, um, consultation period and, and everything uh, moving towards having the application in front of us this morning, and also for the planning committee for the, uh, the debate, the council mill for his uh, reciting the poetry as well. So uh, uh, I don't think I've got any, anything for this way. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Andrews. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, reiterating what Councillor Hardwicks has said, thank you all again. Thank you for the, com the committee. Um, I'd like to reiterate, um, obviously, I would like to make sure that Conrad actually still engage with um, St Michael's Hospice on their planting. Hopefully, that will get it satisfied and make sure it's actually agreed in large capacity. Um, going back to what their comments were mutually. Um, again, I'd like to say that um, we're not against green energy, meaning when I say that ourselves, I mean the, the Michael's Hospice the parishes are not against green energy. And again, I would like to reiterate that if we could get government to actually change policy and get new homes built with solar panels and green energy, this will help us all in the future. Thank you. Right, we will move. We'll now move to the vote. Can I remind members that you can only vote if you've been already, um, present for the whole of the, the debate on this. Uh, standing eyes on that, Chair. Can I just clarify what we're voting on? We're voting on the officer's recommendation, Chair. As, as an end of so, Mr. Bishop. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, the recommendation includes um a proposal to uh, that the planning commission is granted subject to the following conditions can i ask that the additional um and any other conditions considered considered appropriate officers named in the scheme of delegating properties it's a, it's a normal tie which is on it enables the officer to tweak the condition as we've suggested today if the proposer and sector are happy with that yes thank you chairman Okay. Are we clear now? Having reminded members that they can only vote if they've been present, so I think that they all have been present during this whole debate. Can I ask for those in favour of the motion? I think it's academic. Those against? There are none, and I don't think there are any. So the motion is carried. Can I now move to an adjournment? Thank you. Can I welcome you back following the adjournment? Can I request that the public speaker present in person for the agenda item seven join the meeting? Ms. Tully, local resident, speaking in support of the application, please take a seat at the public gallery. Good morning, and I welcome you to the meeting. Following the officer's presentation of the application, I'll ask you to speak. If the application before us concerns Cameron from the court, Cameron from Lefry, proposed conversion of two outbuildings to create three new dwellings. The work includes it includes a lean to, to extension to form a workshop to be replaced with a single story extension and open courtyard attached to the former dairy to be enclosed with a new flat roof. 
proposed works to upgrade the existing store, uh, storage building. The second part of the um, um, application is proposed conversion of two outbuildings to create three new dwellings. Works include lean to the extension to the former workshop, be replaced with a single story extension and open courtyard attached to the former dairy with a new flat roof. Proposed work to an existing upgrade. This is um, a, a slightly different. We'll come to that in the office presentation. Thanks, Chairman, and good morning to members and all interested parties. The site relates to County Report, which is located approximately seven and a half miles northwest of Lebury Town Centre. As you just heard from the Chairman, there are two applications for members. The first being 210865 is for Planning Commission, and the second application 210866 is for listed building consent. As you just heard from the Chairman, both applications are for the conversion of two outbuildings, namely the workshops, workshop slash doors and dairy into three dwellings and works to upgrade an existing storage building. The buildings under consideration are considered to be curtilage listed to Cameron Court, which is a grade two listed for Georgia Manor, although they are not listed in their own right. And as you can see on the screen, the buildings are denoted by the red star. And the next slide, please. In which, in terms of site characteristics, at the heart of the site is the grade two listed Georgia Manor, which is now used as a co-housing community with the local parish church of St. James to the south. A considerable, a considerable number of outbuildings surround the site, which is set within parkland and farmland, and topography is relatively flat with a slight, slight fall in a southerly direction. Members be aware that the adopted development plan here comprises that of the Herefordshire Court Strategy, and the Streffen Branson Group MVP has passed a successful public referendum and is formally for awaiting adoption, although in line with paragraph 48 of the MVPF itself, a significant material consideration for awaiting can be afforded to the MVP. And the next slide, please. In which on screen is the location plan, and the photograph also helps to pick up the buildings under consideration. The first building, which is to the north, which I'll do right there, is that of the workshop slash stores, in which the earliest building is a single story structure aligned east to west, comprising a solid brick, back brick wall with sloping roof, with doors and windows through the front wall, and is understood to have stood, originally stood separate from the northeast to southwest aligned structure. But has been infilled with what was probably an open replica structure supported on a single brick pier, recurring infill with windows and timber boards. A second structure has been added to the northern elevation, and this structure is single story with double doors on the east and west elevation and two wooden windows to the north. The rear wall is solid brick and this closes, encloses an area between here and a walled garden. A former glass house has also been subsequently replaced by a modern lean to at the south elevation. The other building relates to the dairy, which is just down here, which is located to the northeast of the manor house and relates to three adjoining historic brick built structures, which are currently used as sheds slash stores, which are located at the surface to the northeast of the main manor and forms part of a curved range of buildings that, together with the cottages to the northeast of the main house, enclose an irregularly shaped service courtyard. All structures again here are single story, with two aligned northwest to southeast. And the other northeast to southwest. Of the northwest and southeast aligned buildings, the main one has a double apex front with a single entrance and rounded head and slate roof. And adjoining this to the west is a later extension with a flat roof, the front wall of which forms the rear wall of an open fronted structure. And adjoining this to the east is a brick structure with brick ends and an open fronted centre. And the next slide, please. In which, in relation to the proposed designs, the main drive design drivers here put forward by the applicant seeks to be low energy, affordable, and be embedded in the community. The design is low energy in its operation and construction. The homes created are to be low cost to maintain, and the homes form part of a cohesive part of the existing community at Cunningham Court. In architectural terms, the existing ward closure is clearly a strong design feature throughout the site, defining the site's architecture as it is often punched through access space behind. It also sometimes provides the base for a lean to structure, and in other instances, is integral to a cottage built along the wall. Living a sustainable and low carbon lifestyle is an important driving force for the community living at Calgary Court and key aim to the proposed development. In terms of materials, retention and repair of existing materials is supposed to be undertaken as much as practically possible, and the use of natural materials is proposed to achieve significant uplift in thermal performance. Each unit is to be fitted with a mechanical ventilation and heat recovery unit and also an air source heat pump. As you can see on screen, these are existing and proposed plans of the dairy and some photographs to just illustrate. And the next slide, please. 
In relation to the dairy externally, the route is to relay the existing tiles and reclaim replacements to match existing. Coping stones will be repaired and reset where necessary with a canopy above the entrance door and a widened opening at the southeast elevation. A small number of new openings are proposed in the northwest elevation. The existing openings made into windows where possible. And here again, there's some more additional photos for the site. And the next slide, please. In which, in relation to the workshop externally, as you can see on screen now, the existing and proposed elevations and some more photographs of the site. Existing openings are to be reinstated with modest alterations. Roof lights are to be kept to minimum, and all brickwork is to be repointed with lime mortar to match to which any grown blown brickwork will be replaced with reclaimed brick to match existing. New horizontal timber padding is replaced at the east and west elevations to improve the existing arrangements, and the roof again is to be relayed with the existing tiles and reclaimed if needed replacement to match that of the existing. Vertical Douglas fir cladding will infill an existing doorway with the brick print below at the north elevation. And the next slide, please. Which here, the proposed elevations have very much been dictated by the scale and proportion of the existing buildings themselves. New additions, such as the replacement of the Emporium to the south of the workshop, is designed to strike a careful balance between living requirements and the proximity and mass in surrounding structures. To this effect, openings are largely kept as existing, unless where additional openings or enlargements are required to accommodate living spaces, reflecting the size of existing openings and have maintained a similar architectural style. And the next slide, please. In which this is also the same with the modest arrangements to upgrade storage unit, which is shown on screen with the proposed existing and proposed elevations and the existing proposed floor plans. And the next slide, please. In which, in terms of landscape, there is informal planting in rural areas which form communal recreation spaces around the site and are managed collectively by the community in the context of the surrounding farmland and parkland, which the uh, County Green Court residents actively farm. Of course, the units after the converted are already established within this landscape setting, and so the approach is to enhance the, the landscaping that already exists as is detailed in the officer report. And the next slide, please. Members who have read the report will note there are no technical objections raised by Welsh Water, Transportation, Environmental Health, Ecology, and Natural of England. The Council's ecologist has been able to complete a HRA appropriate assessment, concluding the scheme as presented complies with the relevant criteria as set out in the Council's current position statement of development within the low catchment. Natural England have considered the proposed development will not have significant adverse effect impacts on designated sites and has concurred with the Council's conclusions that there are no objections to the, the appropriate assessment. Members will note that the Council's building conservation officer has objected to proposals. However, in the view of your officers, that through the retention and conservation of historic working buildings in conversion to a new residential use, that the setting, significance, and experience of these buildings will remain unaltered by their conversion and adaptation. <coughs> Rather, it is any ancillary work to accommodate the new use, such as the new access and car parking, that may at that point lead to a potential impact on setting and character. And just to clarify that the existing parking arrangements are for an altar as you go into the site itself, there's a communal parking area in front of the manor house and also to the rear, which is where the proposed residents will be parking. So there'll be no additional parking areas created as a result. For a scheme to work, of course, it will need to lead to less than substantial harm. And of course, in applying the paragraph 202 test for the NPPF, officers would consider there to be two clear public benefits. Firstly, that of a sustainable new use of the buildings, which although not unique, avoids the buildings falling into total disrepair. Secondly, and perhaps what is more applicable from a localised perspective, is the tenure of affordable housing, which has a positive impact on maintaining the viability and vitality of this community and the local economy, which provides some considerable social and economic benefits. It is for this reason that officers consider that the benefits would outweigh the level of substantial harm which has been identified. I would refer members to section 6.6 and 6.9 to explain the affordable unit arrangements, as well as the schedule on the site schedule by the to explain. And in terms of assessment of these proposals, members will be aware that the council will demonstrate a five year housing land supply. The proposals would not require a complete rebuild with the design perspective and the character of the expansive rural area, and the only significant alterations would necessitate the replacement of existing extensions on the existing footprint, to which cost is identified through reasonable alterations along with small changes to the existing or new demonstrations. The buildings are clearly capable of accommodating the proposed new use without the need for substantial alteration or extension, and so rebuildings, areas of hard signing or development, which individually all taken together would not adversely affect the character or appearance of the buildings or have a detrimental impact on its surroundings and landscape setting. What it is noted that the Council of Building Conservation Officer does object to the proposals, 
your officers consider the delivery of a low cost affordable unit to meet local need should outweigh the harm identified. And that this is a clear public benefit as recognised in the support of consultation response from the Council to strategic housing team. The principal amendment would therefore be accepted in that the application of the policies RA3, RA5 and H2 of the Council's adopted core strategy, which is consistent with sections 5, 12 and 16 of the NDPS, and policies SG3, SG5 and SG8 of the Sheriff Bramson Group NDP. Members, of course, refer to publicised schedule updates to justify why the planning obligations considered to be reasonably necessary to avoid the potential promotion of new dwellings in open countryside without appropriate justification. As such, the proposals are considered to be representative of sustainable development and therefore benefit from the positive presumption enshrined in the NPPF. It is accordingly recommended that the Planning Commission and this facility consent be granted as laid out in the recommendation and as amended by the schedule updates. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now <clears throat> move the speakers? Ms. Tully, uh, um, a local resident to speak. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So we're delighted at the recommendation that this application be granted Planning Commission, and we appreciate the time that the planning officers have put in to visit the site and also to understand the intention and the motivation behind our application. Set up 42 years ago, the community at Calabrian Court has been focused on the stewardship of this historic site and the use and enjoyment of it by the 45 people that live here and the wider community. The site is legally owned and managed through what is now known as a community benefit society. This is one of the recognised ways uh, to provide community-led housing and guarantees that assets are held for community benefit in perpetuity. The motivation of this entire project is to continue this in an affordable way. The housing market's changed hugely in those 42 years since Cannon Room Court started, and it's become more and more difficult for people to move in. We've already started to address this. 11 years ago, we set up a shared ownership fund. More recently, we've established a rental dwelling, green fence for those unable to purchase a property with an affordable rent linked to Herefordshire's local housing allowance. These initiatives have benefited, benefited three families so far, uh, of which two have a local connection uh, and are currently resident. One of these beneficiaries grew up here as a child and is now able to offer her young son the same opportunity. The business plan that accompanies this planning application states that we will, as a community, use proceeds from two leasehold sales to create one shared ownership unit. We're doing this as the only financially viable solution to creating affordable housing here. The expansion of the community is contingent on there being an affordable element. It's minuted and recorded that we will only increase our community size in the pursuit of affordable housing. We've been able to get to this point through two generous grants, both focused entirely on affordability, which enabled us to explore all the options, leading, for example, to a proposed new sewage system that would achieve a 92% reduction in phosphate to outfall, and also helping us confirm the need and the appetite in Herefordshire for affordable rural dwellings. The community manifestly does not need a section 106 to guarantee affordable homes for local people, as we've already identified a need for affordable housing and have been successfully providing and managing it without any legal condition this far. To impose one on this application, we think will add to project costs and thereby end up reducing the affordability of what we're able to provide. Uh, thank you again, and we look forward to being able to continue our work started well over a decade ago to create ring fenced affordable and accessible ways of living in rural Herefordshire. Thank you. Thank you. If you can please take your seat back in the gallery. Thank you. <coughs> right, the local member is Councillor Jonathan Lester, who will now make his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you to Ms. Tully for her concise and comprehensive comments there. Uh, thank you to Josh Bailey, the officer, as well, for another detailed <laughs> assessment. Um, I'd like to thank the applicant for this scheme. Providing uh, homes in rural areas is to be commended generally. Um, in this instance, we have a very sympathetic proposal which takes full advantage of the benefits of adding to a very well thought out and sensitive development in a historic setting. Um, the proposal is very beneficial in that it provides 
much needed housing for the area, but at the same time, it's, it has that affordable uh, housing element that really takes advantage of the facilities that are always there. It makes best use of the infrastructure, adds to the environmental credentials of the site, and in short, I ask members what's not to like. Um, we welcome the fact that the uh, application is recommended for approval by officers, it has the full support of the parish council, and I'm very uh, pleased to support uh, development, which is proportionate development, that also addresses housing need. Um, as you've heard from the speaker, Ms Tully, though, um, there is the point about the 106, and there is a recommendation to approve the, the development subject to a 106. I would respectfully put forward uh, the, to the committee that such an extra legal framework is, is not necessary. As you've already heard, the, the community have been providing affordable units for the last 12 years without a, a 106. And, and housing, um, under this scheme for the community has to be uh, affordable and kept it affordable in per perpetuity. It's the very essence of what they're providing here. So the quandary is, is not that Windflower want to provide a unit uh, and get away with provide, uh, being ensnared by a 106 agreement, that they it's their whole reason for being to keep this unit uh, affordable in perpetuity. It's just that, in order to make this a truly viable proposition, they want to avoid any extra costs and entering into an agreement for perhaps another housing association that's got lots of resources wouldn't be a problem for them. But when this community is self-funding, it's trying to solve its own issues with housing, this is to be commended. But I think we should commend this approach without the need for unnecessary extra legal uh, um, requirements when it's the whole nature of their setup to secure that situation anyway. So please bear that in mind when you uh, uh, have your deliberations about the scheme, but uh, fully in favour of it. And, and I hope and wish that more communities can, can go down this approach to uh, provide affordable homes and good quality homes that are proportionate to providing those homes in rural areas. Thank you. Well, thank you. We'll now open the debate. Um, indications of speakers. Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, um, uh, um, I'm just, um, I've just had a couple of queries. Um, and uh, one is about the building conservation officer's points. Um, because all that I see that he's asking for were joinery details and timber cladding on storage. On the workshop, it was again asking for stained hardwood and again joining details and timber cladding and rainwater goods proposed. But it, his only objection was really um, around the dairy by not having the four openings and just having roof lights and uh, and moving the shower room and the single bedroom. And I was just wondering, um, has his points been taken on board to change that within the um, the development and um, because he says in his report subject to these changes he's happy to support it so there's no objection so that's my first point and and I'm grateful to Councillor Lester for raising the issue <laughs> because I find this ironic that um, the philosophy of the community is penalized to you know for S106 whereas less ethical developers are able to opt out of six by building less than nine houses in, um, in rural communities. And so it kind of, you know, it's, it's like, so um, I think I agree with Councillor Lester is that if that can be a condition um, to enable a uh, community to use that money for themselves, you know, uh, which seems, you know, from, what I understand of the community is is um, ethical and its philosophy and the way that it's managed. Point and then comes to the second point at the end. I think so. I'll respond to the first point. Um, we have discussed um, the amendments with the applicants. The applicants start that the internal spaces that could be put forward was acceptable, and the fuel losses was we have therefore identified some harm. 
be considered that the affordable element that is being put forth should therefore be a shared benefit to outlay that on that when we apply the paragraph to see what success the NPPS. So that's what so we have we have encouraged the applicants to amend it. They rep they come kept kept become back to us to explain their hearts and existing openings of that walk at the moment. And they've respectfully said that they're internally maximizing their space is is the preference. And we've made that assessment accordingly. And that's why we've said that the affordable element tips the balance in favor of leading to a recommendation of improvement. Because mm -hmm. I think without that we probably would be likely to deal with a different officer recommendation. But I think the second point is probably best to clarify at the end of the debate mm -hmm. that's okay. Council Fabian. Um, thank you. I, th I think it was Councillor Nestor who said what's not to like, and, and I have to agree with him. What, looking at this application, um, it's it's a perfect example of what we can do in rural Herefordshire in terms of providing housing and providing affordable housing and also reducing our footprint in terms of housing. So it, I think it's, it's a fabulous scheme. I did have questions also around clarification around the 106. Uh, confirmation of that and um, and thank you for the explanation about the um, the conservation officers uh, concerns as well but uh, I think in, in also the other thing I wanted to say is that this is a, a really good example of um, using the opportunity to change the a package treatment plan to actually reduce phosphates within the the river log catchment so I, I think it's uh, it's it's really a good scheme and, and I would like to recommend that we go with the officer I would like to suggest we go with the officer recommendation for approval. Are you moving that? Yes. <laughs> Is there a seconder? Okay. Sorry. Paul. Yeah. Paul has a second. Right. Who's the first applicant? <laughs> right. Um, next, sorry. any other speakers? Councillor Milne? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, actually, Councillor Watson, very largely, I said what I, but I was going to say, I'm not going to repeat what you said. Um, it, two conservation officers, both Nick Joyce, highly respected, very capable conservation officer, and Andrew Brislane gave independently very similar advice. And it, and it is it is quite difficult to, to go against professional officers' advice. And I, 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 I just wonder whether, even at this late stage, uh, those openings in the, that rear curve wall, because it, I mean, it, it is a very important architectural statement feature, that, uh, that curve wall. It marks the division between the polite north front overlooking the lake and the utility spaces behind and to puncture it with uh, modern windows uh, a complete <coughs> bench is the message i think that you probably could have punctured it with, with 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 modern windows but they've got to be very carefully carefully detailed and uh the conservation both conservation officers said well if we, if we do do it in um in uh, in aluminium windows, uh, glazing bar three aluminium windows, that isn't really going to enhance or the, uh, the, the the listed status at all. So uh, they did maintain their objection, and it is quite difficult. I mean, I would dearly like love to see this. I mean, I'm very much in favour of this application going through, but I would dearly love to have this looked at again, if possible, whether it can be done outside the room, uh, just a specific matter uh, for the detailing of those openings. So that they don't they don't detract from that that polite facade. Really important. Anyway, thank you very much, Jim. Any other speakers? <clears throat> Councillor Bowen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'd like to support uh, Councillor Miller and his concerns regarding the the openings and that very important wall. Uh, and surely we can negotiate some betterment of what's what's proposed. I, I really would like to see that happen. Uh, Yes, in, in, in essence, it's a, an excellent application, but I think we still got to think very carefully about such a, such a precious part of the design. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other speakers? It has been proposed and seconded. Can I go now to the officers to so, Mr. Bishop? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a couple of points to the couple. I'll pick up the last point first. Um, we propose to add an additional condition 
uh, for um, that treatment to be agreed in writing with the with the with, with the planning team. So we will look at that, and the applicants would have very short discussion today. I'm sure we can reach an amicable conclusion on, on that as well. So we will add additional condition that the recommendation enables that to 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 happen. Um, secondly, section 106. Section 106 is an important was an important factor in uh, in the in the balancing exercise because it maintains the um, affordability of the um, of the one unit. However, um, we 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 have used conditions in the past um, come from the inspectorate uh, when they've used on, on, uh, for affordable units on. On, um, on planning permissions. So, can I suggest that the recommendation is tweaked? It's section six stroke planning condition, and we will endeavour to use the planning condition. Uh, I'm sure we can, but I just want to check check that out with our or with our legal team to uh, to to achieve that. It's it, 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 it's an important it's an important factor for us because within 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 the planning balance. Where, where we've assessed the proposal and you and the public benefits of the affordability needs to be maintained in perpetuity. Uh, I know the aims of the society are, are, are there for that, uh, and I fully support that. Uh, and I'm I'm pretty sure we can get through that by by use of the uh, of, an, of an appropriate condition, which is rarely used, but it's only used well on the on sites where there's uh, only the affordability element um, re remaining. So. Let's leave, leave, leave that with us, if, if you would, and we will. Uh, and I, I can concur with. I can consult with the chairman and the local member on that as well to make sure that that uh, meets the aims. Other than that, chairman, the proposal has, has received um, an excellent uh, discussion to, today. You picked up the the main the main points. The 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 the, the friction between the historic building officers. Uh, uh, Recommendation: The uh, proposal to provide affordable housing in in, in in rural areas, which is a key factor and, and a huge factor in within the, within the planning balances, as the case officer said, in, in coming forward with recommendation for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I would remind members that um, the philosophy of our organisations and the personalities of our organisations change over many years, mm. uh, and you know we don't know who will be involved in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have some sort of um, commitment long term to the philosophy, to the policy. Mm -hmm. The local member now, we move to the local member to someone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. And in you know, answer to that point, it's, it's a very good point and properties change hands. But um, I think that for the foreseeable future, and this organisation has a 42 year history of being a community that is uh, in charge of its own destiny, I think if it is possible to have a condition to add um, to the perpetuity of the affordability, that would be a much better solution than burdening a small homegrown community that's trying to keep the viability as a maximum to provide that affordable unit, that would be a much better sensible way of dealing with uh, that balance as, as Mr Bishop has explained. And so so long as um, the recommendation would be approved by condition rather than 106, then I would I would be very, very happy about that. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kinsey. Mm -hmm. Now we come to the voting. Can I remind members that you can only vote if you've been present for the whole of the debate? I think everyone has been uh, present for the whole of the debate. There has been a proposal, sorry. Do the, uh, the proposal and second need to agree the amendment? Oh, sorry, yes, 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 yes. yeah, yeah. 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 both applications, yeah. both. Right. So, we're going to have two votes one for the first and one for the second. Dealing with the first one, can I ask for those in favor of the recommendation as set out with the amendment? Those in favour? Chair, can I just check? It's amendments, isn't it? It's two yeah, amendments. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Right, and now to the second one. Those in favour, please. 
that remains a unanimous emphasis because we can know there cannot be any votes again for abstention. And I thank you all for attending. Is the live stream now ending?